Auckland Tourism, Events and Economic Development is the region's economic development agency, helping to make Auckland a desirable place to live, work, visit, invest and do business. Good morning, how are you today? So, here we are. We're just under seven weeks from the end of another decade. Two decades into the new millennium. And for me, three decades since I finished at high school. So what have those 30 years brought to us from a technological standpoint? Well, internet performance has increased by a staggering one million times. Hard to imagine what an internet connection a million times faster than what we have now would look like. Computing power has increased by at least a thousand fold. So if we compare that computing power increase to the increase in our own intellect in that time, I think it's fair to say that technology is moving at a far faster pace than what we are. So hence, it makes sense for us to be harnessing that power within our organizations. Now, let me share with you a cautionary tale. When I started my career, I was working in the worlds of advertising, publishing, and the print world. Now, if I look back on the firms that were around at that time in New Zealand, many of them have gone. They've been disrupted by a wave of digital and technology revolutions. And even when we stand back and look at the big multinational players, Many of those companies survived only because they acquired the new young upstarts that came into the field. So we have that choice to either ride this wave of the tech revolution or to be knocked over by it. So I think even if your industry isn't one that has obviously a big risk of being disrupted by new technology, I think it's fair to say that your clients and your competitors are going to be leveraging that thousand times increase in computing power. Now the tech revolution creates many opportunities and some people, some organizations maybe even some countries may stand still and miss this wave of innovation. And for those, they're gonna fall back behind. But we have that choice whether to step forward into this world and take advantage of the tech revolution. There's no benefit in fearing the future. We should step forward into this. Now, I believe the tech revolution is for all of New Zealand. We can all participate in this. And although not all of us are technically inclined, we do not need to be so in order to take advantage of the tech revolution. I believe that the tech revolutionaries are those that don't just look at the here and now, but they look ahead, they strategize, and they take action. Now, let's take a moment, if you will, have a think about where will technology place us in the future? If you look ahead one year, two years, five, 10, 20, even 30 years ahead. What will you be doing in 30 years? What about your organization or your sector? What new things will technology facilitate? 
And whilst we can't have complete clarity around what that future will look like, I trust this morning that you will leave with some valuable insights to help you along on that journey. Now, you could say that nothing groundbreaking has happened in maybe the last 48 hours. And you probably can't think of anything in that period, but if we step back a little bit, as, as Simon alluded to, in, this, in, a, in just a few short years, we've gone from dipping into our pocket and having no technology there to being able to dip into our pocket and have an incredible piece of computing power there. Have that instant connectivity with the world to video conference, to connect, to use Google Maps and so many other tools. Now, you probably all know the story of trying to cook a frog. You put a pot on the stove and bring it to the boil and you drop a frog in that, it's likely to pop right out again. I know I'd be jumping out if I got dropped in boiling water. But they say if you put a frog into a pot of lukewarm water and slowly, gradually heat it up, you might just find you end up with a cooked frog. Now let's not miss what's happening here because it, it is appearing to happen gradually because it can quickly sneak up on us. Now if I think about the most innovative leaders in the world, I think it's fair to say that very many of them are tech revolutionaries. I think of the likes of uh, Microsoft and Bill Gates, and he had this idea very early on in his uh, career, the idea of putting a computer on every desk and in every home. Now that's the thinking of a tech revolutionary, somebody that's looking forward. Elon Musk is another, looking forward to this idea of sending people to Mars. Then there was a man who decided to establish a small bookstore in the US, an online bookstore. Amazon today accounts for half of all electronic commerce in the US. Jeff Bezos, very much a tech revolutionary. And then we look here at home in New Zealand, and you might not think of Sir Stephen Tyndall, the founder of the warehouse, as a tech revolutionary, but I remember sitting down and chatting to him about starting the warehouse. And one of the things that he did right at the outset was to connect up his, his stores. And so technology was one of those things that he used to destroy his competition. And then we have Rocket Lab and Peter Beck. Wow, what an incredible story. Young man from Southland, but he had a vision. He looked into the future and he joined up the dots. And today, where hundreds of others have failed, he has achieved this incredible success and now, He's shooting for the moon. So that's going to be a really interesting one to watch. But the lesson is that all of us can choose to be Peter Becks within our given field. We can utilize technology just like Peter and his team have done so to achieve something incredible. Now, there are many dinosaurs out there in the world of business. Many business models and practices where the sun, it's fair to say, is setting. And leading players can themselves quickly become dinosaurs. So let's look at some of those examples. Traditional taxi firms, for instance, 
I remember discussing the wave of uh, Uber as ride sharing started to uh, gain traction internationally. This is a topic we've talked about um, on the New Zealand Tech Podcast many times. And at that time, it, it seemed to me that the owners of taxi firms must be able to do something to stop this wave of disruption. There must have been an opportunity where maybe they could work together and build their own platform that could sit alongside Uber uh, and give people something useful when they traveled and wherever they were um, in a similar way that Uber would. But as we know, most firms sat back until Uber had really uh, you know, taken the market globally. Um, fortunately, we've seen some variations on that, the likes of Zoomi here in New Zealand, which is great. Uh, DVD stores, many will have heard the story of how the founders of Netflix went and visited Blockbuster to share their story and to see if they could get Blockbuster on board. Now, they made a mistake that day at Blockbuster and it's, it's fair to say we all know the consequences because Blockbuster hit the wall. And the world of photography, we can look at Kodak and I met with one of the ex-Kodak staff last year. He was the inventor of the digital camera. But Kodak hit the wall. They didn't quite manage to take advantage of the technology. And so if we look at all of the sectors that we operate in, there are similar challenges and risks. So when we look at these companies that have failed, what did they miss out on? Well, I think often a failure to innovate, a lack of vision, pace and agility, and in many cases, they maybe tried to go it alone rather than looking outside of themselves and looking to partner with others. Now, on the flip side, some firms have done incredibly well, and often these are the new young upstarts. And there are many sectors uh, where, we've, where we've seen that great innovation, the space industry we've talked about, digital payments, the likes of push pay, PayPal, TransferWise. We've got the sharing economy, Airbnb, the Zoomies and Ubers, the digital video world, YouTube, Netflix, and many more and the social networking world. LinkedIn at the moment, an incredible platform. If you're not using it, you should be because this is a tool that gives you a great advantage. And then organizations, even in the nonprofit space, that are standing out from others by doing new and innovative things, the likes of Charity Water and online fundraising platforms. Now, who here today would agree with me that often New Zealanders punch above their weight on the global stage? I think it's fair to say we often do, whether it's in sport, in business, and other fields. And the recently published TIN report highlighted that New Zealand's tech exports could, within just five years, become our top export earner. That's phenomenal. It's something that I think has crept up on us. We didn't notice that technology exports are growing at that sort of pace, around a billion dollars a year. Now, while that's great for New Zealand, unfortunately, we have a little bit of a challenge because if we look at our non-technology businesses and organizations, it's fair to say that we're probably falling behind a little bit. And as a country, we need to step up our pace and get moving. So let's have a look at some of those emerging technologies that are coming through, some of the things that are going to help facilitate this change right now and in the years ahead. I've put a few of them up there, but we'll jump in and, and, and chat through uh, a couple of examples. Um, first up, I want to talk about the Internet of Things. Now, 
IoT or the Internet of Things is about connecting devices together, linking them up to the Internet, being able to draw data and insights from them. What's an example of that? Well, in New Zealand, probably the farm sector is a, is a good one to look at because it, it, it's so important uh, to us. Now, just imagine putting a sensor in the ground on a farm. What could you achieve? Well, you could put in a sensor that tells you the moisture of the soil, or you could have a sensor that uh, tells you whether there's a need for fertilizer. Now, how's that useful? Well, maybe you'll be able to save how much water you need to put into the ground and how much fertilizer that needs to go on the ground as well by having these sensors spread across a farm. And if you saved even 20%, that's gonna make a noticeable difference in terms of time savings, in terms of cost savings. And of course, there's a positive flow onto our environment, which is fantastic. Now let's look at big data. Simply put, I would say big data is all about being able to derive useful insights from the massive amounts of information we have of all sorts of varying kinds. Information that's, that's always changing, some of it's not always very reliable, but being able to draw those insights, whether it's from a traditional CRM systems, whether it's documents we have, videos, but being able to access that as a whole. Now the growth of data at the moment is incredible, the pace, mind-blowing. It's been said that in the next two years, humankind and our devices will create more data than has been created in all of history prior to today. You've probably heard it said that data is the new oil. And yes, it's true, data is incredibly valuable. But the question is, within your organization, are you tapping in and unlocking the value in that data that you already have? And are you thinking about how you will get value from future data? Now, robotics, drones, and automations. This stuff is fun. Also, I think it leaves us with some uncertainty around how our future looks. I guess what I like to look at is the opportunity to use these technologies to maybe remove some of the less exciting, the more monotonous tasks that exist. But it's really up to us to look at what are those opportunities ahead and to define them. Now 5G, this is something we've been hearing a bit about in the media, isn't it? Because in just a few weeks, 5G is going to launch here in New Zealand. Most of us are probably wondering, well, what are we going to do with it? Well, 5G is just one part of a bigger, ubiquitous internet. And here in New Zealand, we've done pretty well with internet connectivity. Of course, I talked about that million times increase in performance over the last 30 years. But that connectivity through fiber, it'll be through 5G and 4G, Wi-Fi. And then we also have coming to New Zealand very soon satellite-based access that will be affordable and fast and fill in those gaps where today internet maybe is, is not so good. Uh, there's a satellite, uh, Pacifica launching, uh, it's going up on, in fact it may already be up uh, on a SpaceX launch this year. So there's some really interesting possibilities that that creates when we have this completely ubiquitous internet. Now who isn't a little bit curious about AI, artificial intelligence, where can it take us? Now I've put this video up today uh, because I think it's actually just cool. Um, this is the same car I drive, but it's running a newer iteration of the software than is made available to the public. And it gives us a little taste, seeing this car be able to drive itself completely on a, on a journey without any human interaction, gives us an idea of where we're going with artificial intelligence and how good it will be in the years ahead. 
Now, applications, they've been around for so long and uh, you know, many of us that have been involved in the tech world in any way may have uh, you know, cut some code in our time. But we're moving into a time where it becomes easier and easier to develop applications and software. And I saw this uh, data shared at a Microsoft presentation showing just how quickly things are gonna step up in terms of the development of applications. I thought pretty, pretty interesting, a seven-fold increase in the number of applications, most of these being developed inside organizations like our own. Then there's quantum computing. Now, this seems to be the sort of hazy thing that's a little bit far off, but it seems to be getting closer. And in fact, Google just shared the other day that they did an experiment that they believe would take a traditional computer around 10,000 years to carry out. How long do you think the quantum computer took? 90 seconds. So how do we decide where digital transformation is needed, where it fits? Well, in theory, digital transformation is quite simple. Start by prioritizing the solving of the biggest problems. Look for the new opportunities that technology brings. Then get in there and execute and create that future. But like with many things, simple isn't necessarily easy. So to help you along, I'd like to look through some of the habits of tech revolutionaries. Now I believe that probably the most important of these is mindset. We've got to get our mindset right. And empathy is at the top of that list. To understand how we can utilize technology well, we need to be able to empathize with our customers and all the other relevant stakeholders. And when I look for an example of who did this so well, I would be picking Steve Jobs, who just seemed to get the need to give people something that was easy and a good fit. Of course, we also need to be willing to experiment and to take risks and to accept that failure is part of the path or the journey to success. We need to be experimenting with new technology to help us gain familiarity with what it can do. As an example of that, when the Alexa smart speakers came out, I bought one for every member of my team to take home, should they wish to have one in their house, uh, to experiment with it and to get familiar with where the technology is going. We need to be strategic in our technology selection and select the best technologies for the job Sometimes we can get caught up with the vendor relationships maybe that we've had for many years when we actually need to look forward and consider new partners. Now, where to? We need to establish a plan, focus on the areas with the biggest return, be as agile as possible, balance business wishes against technology best practices, review and fix broken technology foundations, and I think focus on smaller changes rather than trying to boil the ocean, and of course encourage collaboration both internally and externally. Now we should draw as many insights as we can from the data but also create feedback loops so we're hearing from our customers and hearing from the other stakeholders like those around us. And of course, it's critical that we grow our skills and the skills of our teams. We've got to keep up and attune to what's going on. So how do we do that? Well, I'm a strong believer in continuous learning. Coming to events just like this, listening to podcasts, e-learning, and of course, getting hands-on with technology. 
and then using the tools that are available to us, the likes of social media and RSS feeds, Google alerts, things that will feed us relevant information and keep us current. And of course, execution is always key. We've got to get started, move at pace, be agile, deliver results, and then continuously improve. So ultimately, we need to just do it. A couple of examples of those that have. Rocket Lab, one thing that they did early on was to start small, a handheld rocket that could fly up above a forest and take an image of the forest from above. Uh, one I came across recently, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, was a new hairdresser. Now, how do they attract customers? Well, they got on line and did some Google advertising which attracted an instant customer base to them. Alongside that, they had an online booking system so that they could collect the details and the data and keep in touch with those people as well as draw some insights from that data. And a local insurance company that when they were dealing with a claim for a broken windscreen, by the time you added in hold time and whatnot, probably about half an hour for somebody to lodge a claim for a broken windscreen. They moved that process online and allowed people to go through a chat bot. That took that 20 to 30 minute process down to two minutes. I'd be pretty happy about saving that time myself. I don't like being on hold. So what would your organization look like if every aspect of it was destroyed, burnt to the ground, and you had to rebuild your organization using the latest of technology? How different would it look to what you have today? I hope that triggers a few thoughts for you. So now let's be clear, tech can't solve all our problems but it is a tool with some incredible power and we should be using that intelligently and for good. If all of us here adopt the futurist mindset of a tech revolutionary, just imagine the impact that we'll have. Take the 500 of us here, if we all leave today committed to being tech revolutionaries in our own given fields. Or put it another way, we each commit to being a Peter Beck within our given space. Think of the impact on our lives, on our families, on our organizations, on our environment, our economy, and New Zealand as a whole. Yeah, what I'm saying is that if this country has 500 more tenacious, future-looking leaders that want to change the world, then I think we can. And that's the sort of future for New Zealand that I want to be a part of. So let's get started. Auckland Tourism, Events and Economic Development is the region's economic development agency, helping to make Auckland a desirable place to live, work, visit, invest and do business. 